Dr. Tom Bridge. I'm the Senior Curator of Corals at uh, the Queensland Museum and a Senior Research Fellow at the ARC Centre of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies at James Cook University. One of the things that, uh, that's been really important about this study is that we've developed a technique that allows us to use uh, DNA, uh, molecular phylogenetics, to understand the evolution of corals and the relationships between different species, so to be able to identify uh, different species of corals. Really what we've been able to resolve in the last uh, 20 years or so, there's been a lot of research uh, looking at the deeper splits of groups, so looking at family and genus level. Um, I have a few examples here of uh, two specimens that look very similar. Um, this one in here is uh, from the Bahamas and this one is from the Great Barrier Reef. Now they look quite similar, so many of the species in these groups uh, were thought to be closely related and classified uh, in the same, same genera, same genus, so we thought we had some genera that spanned the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Um, that what the DNA um, told us was that, in fact, many of these species had been separated uh, for tens of millions of years. So the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean corals, for example, uh, had been split for 30 or 40 million years. So um, really for the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a lot of revision of, um, of corals, understanding the relationships between species and how closely related different groups are. What we haven't been able to do until now was get really good resolution from the DNA on the, the tips. So we've got the, the basic branches of the tree. We really um, get a really had a really good idea about that for a while now. But um, particularly um, in the, the really diverse groups, so things like the staghorn corals, also parietes, um, we really haven't been able to have good uh, genetic techniques to delineate species in these really what we call hyper diverse groups. So groups with you know, hundreds of species. We really haven't been able to work that out. So that's what this technique does. In the past, we've assumed that particular characters indicate that species are closely related uh, because they look very similar. But uh, what this new technique is really allowing us to do is to have an independent line of evidence to test uh, some of these theories. And what it's showing is that in many cases, um, species that we thought are closely related aren't. So we're seeing very similar morphologies evolving multiple times in uh, different groups that have been uh, separated for long periods of time, so millions and millions of years. What you can see here, we have a couple of examples of these two species that really superficially look very similar. Um, but in fact, these species have been uh, separated for millions of years, so they're not closely related at all. Now, the other thing that the genetics really enables us to do really well is to be able to say, all right, well, maybe that feature, so um, bottle brush growth form, isn't informative. It's, it appears in multiple groups, um, so we can't say um, which group or which clade this species or this specimen is in just based on that. But we can look at all the specimens that are clustered using the DNA and have a look what are actually the characters that we can use. So these guys are really ecologically important. Um, they provide a lot of the three-dimensional habitat complexity um, that supports coral reef biodiversity, so fish and so forth. Um, they're also increasing the focus of um, things like restoration efforts because of that importance. But um, what we're finding is that what we previously thought was only a small number of species is actually a large number, a much larger number of species, uh, and many of them much more geographically restricted than we previously thought. Um, so most of these specimens here in this group previously belonged uh, to a single species, Acropora hyacinthus, but what we're now finding is that the, the DNA is telling us that what we previously thought was one widespread species is actually a number of different species, many of them with much smaller ranges. So that's really important when we think about things like conservation. So for example, small range size is generally associated with elevated extinction risk. So we previously thought that many of these species were widespread, um, spanning from the Central Pacific right the way uh, across the Pacific and Indian Oceans to East Africa and even up into the Red Sea. Um, but what this technique is telling us is that that's not the case. Trying to understand how many species there are, where they live and what are the characters that we can use uh, to identify them accurately, both in the museum but also importantly in the field because ultimately uh, that's really important as well. There's lots of people that are going out there doing surveys, trying to identify species and 
understanding how species are doing on the reef, especially with disturbances with things like bleachings. And without knowing the species um, accurately and being able to identify them, we really don't know. So we really only have a very superficial understanding of what's going on. Uh, in the Great Barrier Reef ecosystem and on ecosystems on coral reefs more broadly. So uh, that's where hopefully this research will really um, enable us to get a far better understanding of um, how corals are faring.